everyone, it's Melissa from theeyesofaboy.com. I'm here with the fabulous Corey Zwagstra. She's the current Mrs. New Mexico and a fabulous woman. And I'm so excited to have her here today as part of my The Eyes of Inspiration series. Hi, Corey. How are you? I'm great, Melissa. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I asked you here today because I think that you are an inspiring mom and woman. And um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a mom? So I basically am a full-time stay-at-home mom. My husband, Jake, and I have two sons. My son's name is six and just finished his first year of kindergarten. And then my, my son, Gage, is four. So um, we live in a kind of small town in southeastern New Mexico. And really, my focus since the boys have been born has been, a, you know, a hands-on, full-time mom. My journey to motherhood was honestly pretty easy. We didn't, thank God, have any of the struggles with infertility or miscarriages or anything like that that so many moms go through. So we kind of decided, like, we want to start our family. Uh, we went on one big last raw trip we actually went to Africa for three weeks awesome and awesome. yeah it was amazing and then came home like two months of trying and I got pregnant so it was really actually very easy I had you know very simple pregnancies so I was really blessed in that way it sounds it awesome place. that yeah. that was easy so you speak openly about your struggle with postpartum depression um and yeah. when when did that happen um after the birth of your second son, right? Yes. Um, I think with hindsight now, after the birth of my first son, I think I had a pretty heavy case of the baby blues. And there is a very distinct difference between I was going to say, how do you know the difference? So I think, so the, the difference um, between true postpartum depression and the baby blues, which most women experience, is um, the duration of the sort of depression period and how long it's happening and is it happening on a daily basis. So the baby blues typically happens, you know, just as soon as you give birth and it is, it's a very emotional time. You're going through a big hormone dip and up and down. And, um, but if it lasts getting into three weeks, if it's going on every day when you're having feelings of just deep sorrow, when you're uncontrollably crying. Um, and that's the other thing a lot of people don't know about postpartum depression is it has a bunch of different ways that it can manifest. It can manifest in that sorrow. And that's a lot of what I experienced. It can also manifest as postpartum anxiety, which moms are super, you know, anxious about the baby, the safety of the baby. Everything has to be perfect. Nothing's safe enough. Um, and then it can, it can also manifest as postpartum, um, psychosis, excuse me, which is the most severe, um, type of postpartum depression. And that's when you have mothers that are actually harming their children. Um, and there's a lot, been a lot of documented cases and it happens very quickly. It happens very rarely, but it is, it's very dangerous. How did, so, you, how did you know that you were facing depression? Um, we were going through a really hard time in our lives, just sort of that period anyways. My husband's a construction project manager, and we were living in Las Vegas, and this was 2011, so we were coming, you know, we're still down in the deep belly of the economic downturn, especially in construction and real estate. Right. So he, right. Um, his last day on his project was April 1st, and Gage was born on May 18th, so he'd already been home for six weeks Um you know, looking for his next opportunity. And um, I don't know if you know about Las Vegas, but it's hot, 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 hot. Yes. It's kind of, it's, it's sort of like the East Coast, like anywhere with winter, but in the summertime, you're stuck in your house. And um, I just didn't feel happy. I, not that I, I didn't feel happy that I had my child. Right. I felt huge amount of guilt that I had somehow done something by bringing this baby into our family to ruin my son Zane's life. I thought that I, he, we had a whole thing going, you know, we had Jimbery and we had music class right. and we went to the library and we did all these things. And I initially thought I could just chime them right in and add a baby in, put them in the ergo and be done. But it's, <laughs> don't we all it's, wish <laughs> I, it's not that easy. And so then I had all these feelings of failure. Um, I didn't feel connected with Gage. I had spent the last two years with Zane every single day and I didn't feel like I loved him. And even now, like, it's really hard to say, but I didn't. I didn't think that I loved him. I did. Obviously, I did, and I do. I mean, he's one of the lights of my life. But I really, 
Um, that disconnect was really hard for me. I, I did have bouts of crying when I just couldn't get it together. Um, even then, four years ago, was a very social media time. You posted pictures of your baby like every day. And I had this really weird fear about putting pictures of him on Facebook. And so I didn't. I, I, I wouldn't do it. Corey, I I, when I had my first baby, I wouldn't put a picture of him up for three months. Yeah, I wouldn't. I I, I guess, like people, uh, did you, I don't know if you read, I had a stillborn right before, 11, yes. 11 months before I had um, my living son, Johnny. So yeah. I I was obviously in a depression still from losing one child right. and then having another one 11 months later. I wouldn't put, I didn't put a picture of my son up for three months. <laughs> no, I couldn't do it. I felt like I didn't want to share him. I felt like it was like a security thing. I guess I had depression undiagnosed. Good to know. <laughs> you may have. No, and that's the thing. Like, one in five women get it. One in five women have postpartum depression. Like, tr like textbook needs treatment depression. And a lot of people, it just, you don't recognize it. But So I was really worried about that. And as time went on, you know, Gage is three weeks old, a month old, five weeks old. I started having more... Irrational thought. I wouldn't answer the phone for anybody. I, I didn't want to talk to anyone. And yet I felt so incredibly alone, locked in our house in the summertime in the desert. Right. Like I started having kind of whacked out thoughts. I started wondering how I could put together like all of our money, like take our money out of the bank account and just like leave my family. And those are, that's not normal. I have a very good friend whose sister had postpartum depression and she was one of my best friends from college and she was just like every time she talked to me I would fall I, I unconsolable crying and she was really worried and so she had her sister call me and say basically like listen I know we don't know each other that well um I feel like this is what you're going through um she said you know her girls were very very close together um, 17 months apart and she said I would put them in the car and I would just drive around because they lived in Phoenix and same thing it's hot as anything in the summer and I would just cry hysterically she's like it was totally not safe but I didn't know what to do um, so that was kind of my like first indication that maybe this was more than just dealing with all these external stresses that were going on and um, I spoke to my husband and, and he's like no you have you're not my wife like I don't know what has happened to you I had a real breakdown when my mom left. I mean, it would take me four hours to get ready because I couldn't get out of the shower because I was crying so hard. And then I couldn't dry my hair because I was crying so hard. And it was really, like, I think he was seeing that right. things were going on, but he didn't know what to say. And um, so I called my doctor. And that's what my friend said. She said, you need to call your doctor. Um, How old was the baby at this point? I think he was probably five or six weeks old. So you hadn't gone for your checkup yet? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, so he must have been five weeks old because I hadn't gone for my checkup yet. And I, I called and I spoke to her nurse and she I was crying and I said, I really think something's going on with me and I need to see the doctor. And they were amazing. They realized that this is, it can be dangerous. Yeah. And we, the thing that I hate, sort of letting me get on my soapbox for four seconds. The thing that I hate about dealing with this issue is that we take our newborns to the doctor so many times. I mean, we take them when they're three days old. We take them when they're a week old. We take them when they're two weeks old. They go for a month visit. So we've seen the pediatrician like at least four times right. before we ever get back and see our obstetrician. And in that time, you can have a really deep fall into this disorder. Um, so I went and I met with my doctor and I told her, I said, I don't love my baby. I feel like I want to leave my family. I, um, and she was like, you know what? You're okay. Like I thought, you know, by the way that my nurse said on the phone, like I was really worried that we were going to have to do some things today, but we're not. She's like, I'm going to refer you, um, to this, you know, sort of psychiatric care. I mean, not like a psychiatric hospital, anything like that, but an office that does that. Um, they have both a psychiatrist and, um, therapists on staff. So, I did my initial consultation with the psychologist or with the psychiatrist, and um, he said, absolutely, this is what's going on. You're having a chemical issue in your brain. Um, we need to set you up on both a path of antidepressants and then a path of, of talk therapy to kind of work through that. And so that's what I started. Um, and that in itself was really difficult because I feel like in this country we have a big stigma about 
chemicals for treatment of mental disorders. My husband was terrified. He's like, you are nursing our baby. I mean, my husband should be in the La Leche League because he's so <laughs> pro breastfeeding. It's not even funny, but he was like, you can't, he's like, you can't take that and feed our child. Did you even like research this? And I said, well, I don't think a psychiatrist would have prescribed it. He knew I was nursing. So even that was a really hard thing. That's hard to hear. Yeah, it's terrible. I mean, it was really difficult to hear. Did you beat him up? Your husband? No, I mean, we talked about it. I did a lot of like, I read a bunch of, you know, I mean, we all think we're doctors now. So I read a bunch of blogs and some, you know, lactation consultants and WebMD. But he got on board eventually? Yeah, no, because he's like, I can't handle you this way. Right. No, so he did. And um, when you start taking those medications, they don't just instantly make you better. They have to build up in your system, and so it takes a few weeks. And so during that time, um, I was seeing a therapist twice a week and kind of talking through um, what I was feeling, sort of giving me some tactics um, to be able to control um, my worries and – Kind of because when you're in the throes of depression, you don't know your the sensitivity level is so much higher, and you don't realize that somebody saying they can't, can't meet you for a play date isn't the end of the world. When it really, sometimes really feels it like. seems like it though. It does, and so so I felt like I think a lot of moms can relate to that though because I know when you have a new baby and you you want to get out of the house, and, right? And someone cancels, it's like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> I yeah, know. It's, and so pair that with like real chemical imbalance in your brain and it's I mean it was devastating if somebody's like oh just kidding we can't come or um so so yeah so we kind of worked through and I I appreciated the therapist for giving me some skills and I still use some of them today even though I'm totally um healed and over it just things I mean I think as moms we worry And she recommended that I write down all of my sort of irrational concerns before I went to bed. So then I'm not laying in bed thinking about, like, oh, my gosh. Right. You know, whatever. Gage has to get his four-year vaccines. Like, should I get him? Should I put him on a schedule? Do I need to read Dr. Sears? Like, all of the random things that we worry about. Did you ever – I have to send you a link to my video, How Moms Sleep. It it (laughs) – I can only imagine. I have to send it to you – do you get phantom cry where you swear that you hear them crying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're like, are they crying? Is the baby crying? And you're like, your husband's dead to the world. Like, are you? Hey, I ha- the did you crying? write my video script? That's so funny. I have to send this to no. you. This, Why you do. And, and he's laying, because it's real life. Like, your husband's laying there sleeping and we're, like, worried about everything. But yeah. I like that um, advice to write things down. What um, other advice would you have to... Um, a new mom feeling like she is struggling with uh, postpartum depression. And also in that, how did you, um, how were you able to balance being a mom and taking care of your older son while you were struggling with that? Right. Um, Okay. So if you think that's something going on, my number one advice is to call your obstetrician. They will get you connected with whoever you need to get, get connected with. Um, I feel comfortable talking to someone. I feel like a lot of times we see other moms and we're like, oh my gosh, like, and then, but we don't say anything. I think, um, my friend Kristen, who wasn't that good of my friend, I mean, she was my friend's sister. She was really my saving angel. Like she said, like, I think this is going on and this is what you need to do. So, um, so talk to your obstetrician first and foremost, um, would be my number one recommendation. And then, Putting things in place like self-care. When I had Zane, I put everything else to the side that I did and only focused on my child. And it's not healthy. Like you need time away from your from your baby or from your children. You need something that's only you. And that's part of the reason that I, you know, once I had gotten better, I entered Mrs. New Mexico because I needed something that was like my own. It wasn't like, oh, well, I'm a room parent. Okay, but that's still about your kid. Or I do mops. That's great, but it's still about being a mom and being a kid. This you do mops, right? Right. Yes. Um. Not anymore. Now my kids are too big. But yes, I was in mops. I was the coordinator for the mops group here for a year. That's exciting. It's a great. It's a wonderful organization. So. And then you Uh, did Mrs. New Mexico to have something your own. Yes. And you won. And I went the second time. I, um, I competed, two times? Yes, I competed twice. Oh, 
the girl, you're so fabulous. Yeah, well, the girl there, the girl is more fabulous. No, she's amazing. So, um, they, yeah, and it was kind of a dare, like some girlfriends, but it ended up, it ended up being a good thing because it encouraged me to focus on my fitness, which is the other huge recommendation I have for moms that are struggling with that. And all moms in general, when you're dealing with depression and you exercise, you increase your um, endorphins and it really does make you feel better. And even now, if I don't get my exercise in, um, I'm a little testier with the kids. I'm a little shorter with my patients. Like you really, it really is beneficial. So that's what I did. I worked through talk therapy. I um, was on antidepressants for about a year and then phased off of those and then increased my exercise because for that, um, it was like 50 pounds heavier. I was not super healthy and I was kind of uh, miserable. So now sort of full circle brought it around to it, those things. It does help. Exercise was my saving grace after I had my second son also um, 13 and a half months after my first son. So I had three boys, obviously one not right. living, in 25 months. Um, and then I ended up losing almost 100 pounds thanks to the gym um, in nine months. Uh, that was the only thing that kept me sane was working out. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I would be home alone with the kids all day, and when my husband got home, I'm like, I need one hour to be sane. Like, I need one hour. Deal with it, you know? Yeah. I feel like sometimes we have to do that. We have to put ourselves first and be like, T I'm, I'm taking an hour. See you in a little bit, you know? And it's, and it's something that... Or even a shower. Right, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> it's just a matter of a shower. Yeah. Which, but it is. You have to put those things in place because you... I don't want to wake up when my sons are graduating from high school and be like, who am I? What am I supposed to do now? Like, yeah. oh, well, I can't be, you know, the room mom or the driving people to practice or making snacks. Like, what else do I have left? Although those things are, you know, they're, those are so fulfilling as a mom, but it is nice to re retain some of your identity of who you were before becoming a mom, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think for a lot of us who have, a career left our career right you know I, you need you need something and it is I love being home with my boys it's a blessing that I get to do it but sometimes but you have to have something else that's your own agree so, so I I'm so happy that you were able to overcome uh, the postpartum depression and I'm I think it is inspiring when someone can say you know this doesn't feel right for me and I I'm gonna reach out to my doctor for help and the woman that reached out to you, she is awesome as well. Because, you know, sometimes you just need a little push in the right direction or a helping hand. Um, so what do you think has helped you the most as a mom or as a person? And what keeps you going? And what um, healed you, basically? I think that it was, like, seeing my children and seeing how lucky... I was to have them. Um, I have good friends that are never going to be able to be moms, you know, struggled with infertility and never. And so I know that they are my priority blessings. I know that God blessed me with those children and called me to be their mother. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of shame that's associated with postpartum depression. And part of the reason that I don't mind talking about it, even though sometimes my husband's like, that's like private stuff. <laughs> I know that no one's going to judge me to say, oh, when this lady had a six weeks old, she was feeling crazy, you know, but so many people don't get help and it doesn't go away. I think that's one of the misnomers about postpartum depression is that when your baby turns one, it doesn't evaporate and they're like sunshine and roses. It can turn into like full blown um, permanent depression. And if it's wow. not treated, then what kind of mom are you being? You know, then you can't get out of bed. Then you're not being a good mom for your family. So um, I think for me, part of sharing my story, I actually shared my story the first time with my mops group, and it kind of inspired me to share it more, is that I got emails from ladies that were like, no, like I, you know, I considered committing suicide. I considered, um, I did leave my family. Um, and so for you to say, and I think, I think when you put the crown aspect into it, I feel like if you were just to look at me and you see me with a crown on and it's all fancy pants that you would, it's kind of a nice end point to that story to say that I went from who couldn't leave my house, you know, 
to being able to stand on a stage and talk about this experience. Um, I just got goosebumps, Corey. I got goosebumps. <laughs> That, you know, that it doesn't have to be a place you're stuck. It can be, it can be a dot on your story, but it doesn't have to be a place that you're stuck. And I really feel like, too, I, um, you know, I'm a Christian, and when I look back at that period of time, um, I see God's protection over it. Like, it really sucked that my husband did not have a job for six months. Like, it was God protecting us, because, like, what would have happened if I was home with by myself every day with the kids? I mean, he, he was there to help out, and... I don't know what would have happened. Like, I, I can't say that something bad would have happened, but I don't know that, like, I feel like him being there was a protective thing. And then, um, you know, and then we moved to, we moved to New Mexico shortly after, um, while I was still, I was kind of phasing down my talk therapy, but I was still on medication. And the Las Vegas is kind of a very, you know, keeping up with the Joneses kind of place. And, it was kind of nice. I feel like it was a good part of that healing too, to come to a place that was smaller and um, the people in my town are super warm and welcoming. And so it was easy to establish good friendships quickly. Whereas even though I've lived in Las Vegas for nine years, like, I don't know if, I mean, I had some good mom friends, but the network here has been really strong. So I feel like that's a blessing too. And that's the other thing. I think that when, um, when you're talking about postpartum depression, it's not necessarily um, the actuality of not having support, but it's the mom's perception of not having support right. that really right. is a key factor. Um, I know we didn't talk about it really quickly, but some of the factors that are um, predispositions or as if you've had a history of mental illness in the past, um, which I hadn't, if you have kind of a type A personality, which I do. We can't tell that. <laughs> no. Oh. Um, and then, um, some of the in other indications are a, a stressful time. So if you've had trouble in your relationship during your pregnancy, or if you have financial concerns, like obviously my husband was at work for six months. So all those things kind of pile on and you add that with hormones and it just kind of, right. So right. you're cognizant of that now. And, um, I haven't just like, we haven't decided if we want to expand our family or not, like my husband and I both feel like maybe our family isn't complete, but in the back of my mind, I have that time and your risk for postpartum grows up every time you have a subsequent pregnancy. So it makes me nervous. Like, I don't think I could put my family through that again. And so I wonder what, if the risks kind of weigh the blessing of, you know, so it's, so that's another thing. And then also how fast, how much time you have in between your pregnancies is a factor. So the closer your pregnancies are, the higher your risk is um, to develop postpartum. So my boys were 26 months apart. Right. And now your son is four? It's four, yeah. So maybe you would be okay. I, maybe. You guys are a beautiful family. It would be nice for a third. I'm on that page of like, okay, I'm back to normal too. Like, Right. Oh my God, a third baby. Whoa. But it's scary to think, to throw the balance off of your own brain, your own family. Um, but what do you think you would do differently uh, if you were to have another child? I think that my perception of support would be different. Um, I think that I would be a little bit more confident in having, like, a higher expectation of health for my husband. I just wanted to be that super mom that did everything. I had dinner on the table, the house was clean, the kids were like happy and learning Greek or doing whatever. Like I wanted it to be like amazing. And that's not reality. Like it's, and so I feel like my husband and I have grown in our marriage since then. Like we'll celebrate our 10 year anniversary in August. And like, it's okay for me to be like, okay, I made dinner, like get the dishes. Um, so I think my perception of support would be different. I think my knowledge of indicators would be different. And then I would talk with my OB and say, listen, I have this history and um, we need to, we need to, there are some things that they can do preventative wise um, leading up to giving birth to kind of quell those um, hormone spikes. So there's like both, you know, the psychological and then the medical that they can balance. So I don't know. We'll see. Well, also, I don't know. I'm kind of old. I'm 36, so I feel like maybe that's like too old to have another baby. I, first of all, you do not look old. So I think that the tips that you've shared for other moms are super helpful, and your story is very inspiring because it would be so easy to, um, you know, fall into a depression and and not admit to yourself or 
other people that you're struggling um, and you know to look at you as a beautiful woman and someone who ha you know is Mrs. New Mexico so but to look at you as someone who is on stage as a beautiful woman you know wearing a crown you would you know a, a lot of people would not assume that you've struggled uh, the way that you have and so sharing your story definitely is beneficial to other women who may be going through this and it's inspirational to see that you want to share your story with everyone because you're real you know yeah. it's easy to look at someone and say she's got it all together she's super mom and you're letting us know it's okay to not have it all together sometimes Absolutely, because I don't think that any of us do, and I feel like sometimes when you fight so hard to, like, have it appear that everything's perfect, it only makes it more difficult, like, in reality, to keep that front going. But, no, I think when you attempt to put up the facade that everything is perfect, it's because I feel like I did try to do that, and it only made it, like, you were like that duck, and your head is up here, and you're like, hey, everything is right. awesome, <laughs> and then, like, underneath, you're, like, barely keeping your head above water. So. Right. Corey, thank you so much for being with me here today and sharing your inspirational story. Um, I've really enjoyed learning from you and listening to you. And I really do think that it is awesome that you're sharing this uh, struggle with everyone. And you'll probably help another mom that is out there that's going through the same thing. So it was super nice to meet you. I appreciate everything and hope that you have a great afternoon. You too, Melissa. It was so great to meet you. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.